Hello and welcome to the FSAI's 2021 Consultative Council Open Meeting. My name is Suzanne Campbell and I will be the chair for today's discussions on food safety culture. Dr. Pamela Byrne, Chief Executive of the Food Safety Authority of Ireland, will open the meeting. Ray Bow, Chair of the FSAI Consultative Council and Head of Food Safety and Quality at Musgrave Group, will then explain the role of the Council and introduce you to our keynote speakers. During the last hour, we'll have a panel discussion. And if you have any questions during the event, please pop them into the questions box and we will ask them during the panel discussion. We will also run a poll halfway through the event. And if you're on social media, let us know you're here with the hashtag FSAI events, all one word. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank you also for agreeing to chair the open meeting this afternoon. Distinguished guests, Food Safety of Ireland Consultative Council members, our regulatory partners, members of the food industry, consumers, colleagues and friends. Welcome to the FSAI's 2021 Food Safety Consultative Council Open Meeting. Today we will be talking about the importance of having a culture of food safety in your business, how it benefits food businesses and most importantly how it benefits consumers. But let me start by setting the scene. Ireland's agri-food sector exports to over 180 markets across the world. In 2021, Ireland ranked first in the Global Food Security Index, and we are recognised as a country with a strong system of food safety controls, a system that is scrutinised by the European Commission regularly, and one that is always identifying opportunities to improve. From a regulatory perspective, our national food safety experts are called on to support setting national, EU and international standards in food safety and authenticity. Ireland's global reach and its ability to influence is second to none and an agri-food sector with a commitment to and the ability to demonstrate a strong culture of food safety will continue to protect the lives of those consumers in 180 markets across the world. Since the 3rd of March 2021, there has been a legal obligation on food businesses in Europe to establish, maintain and provide evidence of a food safety culture in their food business. So apart from the legal requirement, why do food businesses need to have a food safety culture and why do they need it now? Because when they don't, things go wrong. From product that can't be sold or consumed to the worst case scenario that consumers get sick or even worse, people may die. There is a comprehensive legal framework that places the legal responsibility on food businesses to only put food safe, safe food on the market. And the food system we live in is more complex, fragmented and global than ever before. It is this complexity that demands that food safety goes beyond the formal legal requirements and becomes embedded within the culture, becomes the way we do things around here. So what is a food safety culture? It is the attitudes, the beliefs, the values that are shared by all people within a company, from the leadership to those driving the trucks and distributing the food products. In essence, it's about how we make safe food around here. For a food business, food safety culture means doing the right thing when it comes to ensuring food safety and embedding best practice standards to ensure food safety is the top priority in a food business. It is reflected in how an organisation does its daily work. It can have positive or negative outcomes depending on how things are done or not done. The phrase, if it is not safe, it is not food, comes to mind. Later we will hear from some of these market leading Irish companies and what they do to ensure an excellent food safety culture permeates through their business. Through recent polls on our social media channels, we know that 93% of consumers expect food businesses to have a culture of food safety embedded in their food business. However, despite Ireland's high standards when it comes to food safety, we, together with our regulatory partners in the Health Service Executive, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, the Sea Fisheries Protection Authority, the Local Authority Veterinary Service and the Food Safety Laboratories, continue to see serious instances of businesses that have very poor food safety culture and in some instances, these dangerous practices are being led from the top. Many of these businesses operate a culture that clearly does not place a value on food safety and importantly on consumer health. Within them, management team nor employees often do not see food safety as an important or necessary to be successful. Over the last few years, it has become evident that while the majority of businesses do things correctly, there are a variety of businesses of all sizes and types that produce food for a national and international market, sometimes for the consumption by very vulnerable consumers, that demonstrates a very poor food safety culture, 
Some have had sophisticated strategies in place to emulate an effective food safety culture, where in reality there is none. In some cases, we have seen deception led by management that was so elaborate that could only be detected through deep and thorough investigations following a receipt of a protected disclosure made by staff working in those businesses who are very concerned about food safety. In a world that is placing a bigger and bigger emphasis on doing the right thing, even when no one is looking, we are asking food businesses to do just this, to get the food safety basics right, lead from the top, and make food safety a part of your culture. As Frank Yanis, Deputy Commissioner for Food Policy and Response in the US FDA says, the goal of food safety professionals should be to create a food safety culture, not a food safety program. I would go further and say, the goal of every food business is, should be to create a food safety culture and not just a food safety management system. Because not alone will the best food safety culture enable businesses to comply with the law. It also underpins trust with consumers, trust in your products, trust of your customers, trust of and in your partners in the supply chain, and your trustworthiness as a company will sustain when things unintentionally and unexpectedly go wrong in food safety. In the Food Safety Authority of Ireland, our vision is safe and trustworthy food for everyone, for you, for me, for our families and for our friends. And this is only achievable by working together with our regulatory partners and supporting food businesses to understand their legal obligations. But it requires commitment from all food businesses to having a strong culture of food safety. We look forward to supporting businesses who want to do the right thing, to aid them in developing the best food safety culture they can in their businesses, one that has the protection of the consumer's health at the heart of it. Today, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers who will speak to how collaboration and best practices can allow Ireland to thrive as a good example of food safety culture globally, and more importantly, keep the consumers of Irish food at home and abroad safe. We will learn from them on how positive food safety culture impacts on consumers, food businesses, and the role of the regulator. I'm really looking forward to hearing our keynote speakers and the views of all the panel. So before I uh, hand over to Ray Bow, I'd like to thank the Food Safety Consultative Council for all of what they've done and the work they're doing to support us in the Food Safety Authority. But make sure you engage with us and your questions on the chat option. Ray is the chair of the Food Safety Consultative Council and is also head of Food Safety and Quality at Mosgrave Group. So over to you, Ray. Thank you, Pamela, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, as, as Pamela said, uh, I've, I'm chair of the Food Safety Consultative Council and, and also um, head, group head of Food Safety and Quality at Mosgrave, uh, under which we include the Super Value, Centra and Daybreak brands here in Ireland. Um, on behalf of myself and my fellow council members, I'm really delighted to welcome you all to today's open meeting. For, for those who are not familiar with this, the council is a formal part of governance within FSAI and is in place for two main purposes. The first of those being as a forum uh, of debate on food safety issues, and the second to provide advice to the FSAI board on areas of relevance. The council is comprised of 23 members drawn from a range of backgrounds, including regulators, food service and manufacturing industries, service providers, trade associations, and consultants, as well as experts in the area. We meet quarterly to examine segments of specific areas of the food sector. Uh, we also have an annual open meeting in person. However, today we have an even wider reach due to the virtual nature of the event, as well as giving us the opportunity to have speakers and attendees join us from much further afield than might have been the case before. The topic today is one that I'm personally very excited about, uh, which is the development of a strong food safety culture as a key element in building an enduring food safety management system. In fact, our team at Musgrave is continuously developing our own food safety culture to make food we sell even safer for our own consumers by driving standards and continuously creating greater food safety awareness throughout our organization. I was also very fortunate to be part of the GFSI technical working group that developed the first position paper on food safety culture, which is now a real entity in the sense that it has finally been enshrined in law uh, earlier this year, as Pamela has mentioned. It's now something we all have to be much more aware of, regardless of our role in the food industry. Today's session is unique in that our speakers will give us great insights into the impact of food safety culture from both an international and a domestic perspective. Our speakers for today are Dr. Lone Jesperson of Cultivate 
And Long is an expert in food safety culture and works globally with many large retailers, manufacturers, and regulators. And Mike Taylor is chairman of STOP, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to um, stopping food illness and was previously deputy commissioner for food and veterinary medicine at the FDA. And Brian Highland is a food safety and quality director at Dawn Meats. And Brian will describe the approach to food safety culture across the Dawn Meats network. So I'm really looking forward to today's session. And I hope it'll raise our understanding of the power and the impact of a strong food safety culture. Uh, thank you for listening. And now I'm going to hand over to Suzanne Campbell for the rest of the session. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Now our first two speakers, Lone and Mike, are going to continue the food safety culture conversation. They will discuss how we can collaborate to protect consumers, increase trade and improve business. Um, thank you very much, Suzanne. And, um, Thank you very much to Dr. Pamela Byrne and to Ray Ball for the kind introduction and also invitation. It's a very humbling experience to be here today in, um, in partnership with Mike Taylor, somebody that I personally have been a fan of for a very, very long time. And having uh, the opportunity here to share some thoughts around culture of food safety, how it influences what we do every day in our fine industry to save lives, how it influences a uh, trade that we do between and within countries, and also how it helps to improve businesses globally is a really exciting moment for me. So, uh, Mike, what do you say? Should we kick it off? Have a, a good conversation? Let's, let's do it, Lo. Looking forward to it. Brilliant. Thank you. So what Mike and I were going to do today is we're going to share um, three different perspectives uh, when it comes to a culture of food safety. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, food safety culture from the, uh, from the perspective of the consumer. We're going to also address some of the perspectives as practitioners, as food businesses, and, and how we integrate culture into what we do for food safety. And finally, a perspective on what's happening in the regulatory field Pamela has already spoken of this and we're going to try and uh, just add a little bit more detail in and around that. So I'd like to kick it off um, and, and get started with our conversation around consumers. I think before we drive into talking about uh, specific consequences around both consumers, food businesses and regulators globally and domestic in Ireland, we have to just come to terms with what is one of the formal definitions out there around the culture of food safety. Ray mentioned this, that uh, the GFSI position paper offers a definition that that group of 37, very uh, knowledgeable and to some extent opinionated people uh, came together and actually came up with this definition and some of the uh, dimensions for culture of food safety. It is like Pam also, Pamela also said, uh, about shared values, norms and beliefs. And it's about how these shared norms uh, and beliefs affect mindsets and behaviors towards food safety in, across and throughout a food company. I wanna just highlight a couple of uh, items or uh, phrases in the, in the definition, if you don't mind. It is about this notion of shared. We talk a lot about that food safety equals behavior, but food safety culture is when those behaviors and those assumptions are shared across a group of people which is also why we're talking increasingly around social norms when it comes to food safety culture. So it's when we have these strong social norms that are shared across a group that we can say that we're working towards a very mature and positive food safety culture. Because that's another thing about culture as we all know it today. It's not an is, is not, or have, have not. Every food company by definition has a food safety culture. You might not like yours, you might think it needs to change, or you might think that it's absolutely brilliant. But fact of the matter is that a culture is something like a living uh, entity that needs to be worked at and improved constantly. And it is shared in and across and throughout the company. It's when we have these shared values that we can say that we're doing our absolute ut uh, utmost and best to uh, protect the consumers. And I know, Mike, that you have a perspective on this from your work with uh, Stop Food Bornelms. 
Well, I, I do, Loan, and I'm I'm really pleased to have a chance to to share that perspective with folks today. I, I like Loan, really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I also just must say uh, about Loan, <laughs> um, you know how grateful we are at Stop Food War Illness to be working with Loan as a true partner on our food safety culture work. It's a tremendous collaboration, and I'm grateful for the, the enormous expertise and passion uh, that Loan brings to this work. Um, I, I do want to reflect on the, the topic of food safety culture from the consumer vantage point um, and, uh, and, and also really emphasize the theme of, of cooperation. And it goes without saying that consumers are the ones who ultimately benefit from strong food safety cultures as part of you know, effective food safety management systems um, because their food is safer. And, and so that's a given and, and that's why we're here is to, is to see that we're doing everything we can to, to protect uh, those consumers. Uh, but I wanna focus on what consumers can do and are doing to help foster strong food safety cultures. And that really comes to um, uh, my current role uh, with Stop Foodborne Illness. Uh, but also I wanna reflect a little bit on what I've seen in terms of the impact of consumers you know, through my past experience in, in the U.S. government, yes, at, at FDA, but even going further back to uh, uh, my experience at the Department of Agriculture at the Food Safety Inspection Service, where I was administrator of FSIS um, after the Jack in the Box uh, outbreak happened. It was such a catalytic uh, event. Stop, um, just in case you don't know, is, is a grassroots nonprofit uh, organization. Uh, it's, it, it supports uh, and represents individuals and families like the ones depicted here who have experienced serious injury uh, and in many cases have lost loved ones to, to foodborne illness. Uh, these, are the, these are the people whose voices we believe are essential to the, to the food safety culture uh, conversation. STOP was, was founded uh, in the wake of the Jack in the Box outbreak uh, almost 30 years ago at a time when there were other E. coli 015787H7 outbreaks happening. Uh, and it was founded by mothers, uh, some moms who, who had lost children um, or had children seriously permanently damaged in, in those E. coli uh, outbreaks. And what STOP really is all about is providing a vehicle for these people uh, to bring their passion and their commitment uh, to the subject of food safety and to, to share their personal stories of their experiences uh, to convey the human dimension of food safety, why food safety matters so deeply uh, at a human at a human level, um, and you know, I, as I suggested, have had personal experience with the impact of, of these stories. I I went uh, when Jack in the Box happened. I was at the Food and Drug Administration in a sort of a broader policy role, working on food safety to some extent, um, but working on other things as well. Um, uh, I was asked to come over to FSIS, uh, you know, to help do the reforms, the HACCP and pathogen reduction forms that we did in the 94, 96 period. Uh, and when I accepted that offer, I, I kind of saw food safety as a very interesting and important professional interest, uh, but it was one of many. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it was something that was in my professional world. Well, in the first weeks that I was at FSIS, two of these moms came in, uh, Nancy Donnelly and Mary Hirsink. Um, uh, Nancy had lost her six-year-old child uh, to 0157 in ground beef. Uh, uh, Alex, um, uh, Mary Hirsink's son, Damien, 11-year-old, was seriously and permanently injured um, from, from E. coli in, in, in ground beef. And they came into my office and, and with a certain amount of anger <laughs> about the, the fact that at that time there was no requirement in the, the, the USDA inspection program to control or reduce uh, pathogens in raw meat and how unacceptable that was to them as human beings. But just, just passionately, earnestly saying, we, you know, please <laughs> fix this, you know, please see to it that others aren't going through the same experience that we were going through. And the motivation very well as much was about channeling their loss to help uh, other other people. Um, this had a permanent effect on me because it took food safety from a, a, a professional interest, which I enjoyed, to a personal interest and something that it really changed the whole arc of my career in terms of how I think about the work that I, I do. And, and, I've, and I've seen that impact in a lot of other settings with a lot of other people. 
you know, fast forward, um, stop, uh, continued to advocate for food safety policy change, joined with the food industry and joined with the government uh, to support the Food Safety Modernization Act and brought their personal stories into that public policy arena with, with, with great impact. At the same time, um, you know, STOP started um, uh, working with individual companies who were asking them to come and present their stories to, to those companies. So, so here is an organization um, and, and with a, I think a very strong vision um, uh, fueled by enormous amount of passion. Um, the vision is simple. It's a world without foodborne illness. And, and again, what they do, broadly speaking, to contribute to that mission is tell their stories in any way they can to anyone who will listen and, and to work with anybody who shares their goal, their vision of a world without, without foodborne uh, without foodborne illness. Um, so as I said, um, stop started in advocacy, but but really its mission has expanded significantly. Um, and and you know, its mission now really is focused on collaboration, recognizing that we now have in today's food safety environment where we have tremendous focus on preventing pathogens in food. We have regulatory frameworks that are focused on this. And, and now, now the question is, how do we implement those? How do we do the right thing every day? We now know so much more about what the right thing is to do. How do we accomplish that and the core idea behind the stop mission and, and really building on its history uh, is to provide the the answer to the why why food safety is important to put the human face on food safety and to to support those who are working hard in their businesses to make food safe working in government to make food safe support those efforts to support the food safety culture initiatives that are that are going on in, in these in these organizations so uh, the focus really, very much now at STOP is food safety culture. Um, we are doing that, as I say, in a collaborative way. And, and I, I'm, you're going to hear later, you know, what is really a very center piece of our collaboration, uh, which is an initiative called the Alliance to Stop Foodborne Illness, uh, in which STOP is working with now 18 large food manufacturers and retailers who want to use the stories of STOP to support their own food safety culture activities, but also to support uh, food safety cultures, you know, strengthening of food safety cultures among their suppliers, the small and medium-sized businesses that are so critical uh, to our to our food system. So, you know, I'm um, I'm I'm proud to be able to be part of this enterprise, and um, and really grateful that that we now have a set of industry partners who are right with us, and and really wanting to take full advantage of what these human beings who've been hurt are are wanting to contribute. Uh, so that others are not hurt in the, in the, in the same way. So you'll be hearing more about this in, in later uh, presentations. And uh, again, thank you for the chance to, uh, to share a little bit about STOP with you. And I look forward to joining in the conversation as it goes along. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and I think just hearing you tell your story and how you got engaged with, with the two mums that they came in and visited with you, um, I think we can all have we can all reflect on personal stories like that and um, that is why we're all uh, looking at food safety culture that has to be the, the number one reason why it is to protect those vulnerable consumers that we serve food to every day yep. um, i think we um, we also uh, second to that have to look into the influence that food safety culture has on practitioners in on businesses and um, Mike and I wanted just to position a couple of thoughts on that, um, specifically around how uh, food businesses today are incorporating uh, food safety culture into just how they operate their business every day. So we're going to share just a couple of thoughts from Vanessa Kaufman, who uh, works with, I'm getting a little bit of uh, studio feedback, maybe it's just me. Um, Vanessa has a, a key role in the alliance that, that Mike just shared, um, and we're going to hear just a little bit from Vanessa as for what that uh, the alliance is doing with these wonderful companies. Maybe.
Well, and I'd be happy to say a few things about what Vanessa might have said or, or note a few points that Vanessa might have made if, um, if the video doesn't work. Sorry, what's that, Mike? I was saying if your video is not working, I'm happy to, to make a couple of comments along the lines of what Vanessa, I think, was going to just say to flesh out a little bit what the, what the alliance is all about and its value to the, to the companies. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, the, the, the alliance is all about companies who want to build strong food safety cultures and see the value of these personal stories uh, coming together and partnering with STOP and with the large constituent of, of STOP, the, the people who had the experiences, to devise creative ways to use those stories in the food safety culture programs of, of the company. Some of this has to do with you know, making very tailored uh, videos that relate to the particular business and that are used, for example, in all new employee training. Um, it's creating personal relationships with some of the, the victims of illness and, and having them be present and able to meet with people in the companies on a, on a recurring uh, basis. Um, importantly, um, you know, it's also about looking beyond the four walls of these large, very forward-leaning you know, companies committed to food safety and using their expertise, their experience, and their interest in strengthening food safety cultures among their suppliers. And that's a critical opportunity, we think, uh, to help foster building strong cultures across uh, the, the food system. Um, one, one thing I, I want to emphasize about the, the, the Alliance and one of its themes and values to the companies is that it's a forum for the companies to share their food safety culture practices, to share how they're using the, the, the resources and the stories of stop constituents, uh, how creative tools are being developed uh, to make you know, these, these stories workable in the realities of company training and, and you know, kind of you know, kind of human resource management programs, gamification sorts of, of, of tools to, to use far beyond my expertise. Um, but again, the, just emphasize the point that the, the Alliance is a forum for companies to work together, share, uh, their experiences, uh, and then again, collaborate to try to support food safety culture uh, up their supply chains. And the last thing I'll note is that the Alliance has become uh, really a vehicle for consumers and industry, not only to be collaborating among themselves, but to be collaborating with FDA. And I'll, I'll mention something more later about the way in which uh, the Alliance is, is working very closely with FDA on, on its new era commitment to, to food safety uh, culture. I didn't do this as well as Vanessa would have, but I'm, I'm happy to <laughs> fill in if that's if that's helpful. Thank you so much, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, we live in this virtual world and sometimes it just doesn't play ball, but um, the main points that were made by Mike is, is so well put. It's about collaboration. And it's also about figuring out how we can uh, develop some tools that all of us can benefit from uh, using within our businesses to improve food safety and the culture around it. And uh, I'd like to just share a couple of thoughts with you as for, so, so what are some of those challenges that we see at uh, Cultivate? So we've measured um, food safety culture in over 110 businesses globally now. And some of the, the challenges that some of the companies have and, and the most frequent ones is, is what I'd like to just share a couple of thoughts on. One of them is uh, really bringing risk to leaders so that they have this uh, risk visibility as we like to call it um, and really what that means is that uh, that leaders who are in decision making positions like many of you i'm sure on this uh, on this session is uh, how can you uh, get a grip of your food safety risks and hazards so that you can uh, make decisions strategically and tactically around how you best manage them within your business. And, and one of the, the things to be aware of is this great work by Yoshida, uh, where he talks about the, the iceberg of ignorance. Now, given uh, it's not ignorance that we all uh, wake up one day and say, I'm going to be ignorant today. It's just some things that, that work out that way because we have multiple things to focus on every day. 
And what he has brought to life for us is really this notion that there's an incredible gap between what senior leadership are perceiving as the risks versus what the frontline staff are. And in my mind, the work that we do with businesses and the work that you are doing, many of you within your businesses, is to narrow this gap. Essentially, we are trying to to really squash this pyramid down so that there's a very small gap between what senior leaders are seeing as the gap to your risk to your business around food safety and what your frontline and supervisors see. One way that we've uh, worked with the company to do this um, is through established systems like HACCP. And uh, Mike talked a little bit about his, uh, when he started in 96, I think he said, Mike, around HACCP and introducing the concept of HACCP. And, um, We've done a little bit of research in some, some cases with companies where we're using HACCP and the established team to really improve a company's food safety culture with them. And I'd like to share a, a, a case study of that. Uh, so in this case, it, it was a company, it's a meat company with multiple manufacturing sites. Um, they were experiencing regular uh, environmental monitoring positives. Uh, so they would find um, some positives for having pathogens in their, in their all of their sites. They would find them, remove them, um, but still they would find some positives on an ongoing basis. Now this next situ situation is really critical to the definition of food safety culture because the leaders were found that um, their estimation, this low estimation of food safety risks were really founded in or anchored to that they have, um, they perceived that they had a very strong food safety and quality department the EMP findings are those environmental monitoring positives. There were relatively few, like we, we hoped to find, but psychologically, we look at smaller numbers with less urgency than we do big numbers. And this was one of the things for these leaders. And they also had these regular discussions, but it was really around customer complaints. So very um, lacking indicators, not really tied into the risks that a frontline of supervisors would see in their facilities. So we said, what could we do to increase this? One thing was to say, where are risks discussed? And we found that it was mostly discussed within the HACCP teams and not really in management or executive meetings. We then set in uh, to do a little bit of an assessment in May, 2020, and we used for that um, a scale of HACCP proficiency developed by Professor Carol Wallace and um, found that across these three plants, so there was a total of 21 HACCP team members that we originally did the proficiency test with. Uh, one of them decided to um, not complete the test and that's why you're seeing number nine, there's blank. But we, we said these are the 20 people that are really put in charge of managing the, the risks for the company uh, proactively. And we found against this scale from Professor Carol Wallace um, that the team had a proficiency level of 33 to 66%. And this, this is really measuring proficiency in both what they know about HACCP, but also how they would act on it. So that was our benchmark before we went in and worked with them. Then we looked at these three areas that are also the most common ones that we uh, end up working with companies on after measurements. One is how do we uh, make um, risks available, again, visible to leadership so that top leadership um, and critical business risks are really put together. So top leadership will not speak of critical business risks without linking it to food safety as well. The second one is um, how to develop a guiding coalition or a team that will at all points in time be as critical as possible of their own culture of food safety and also be the ones that really lie awake at night worrying about the change over time. And then the third thing is around establishing a rhythm where there's a constant nudging and recognition of food safety, behaviors, attitudes of those that are involved. So we looked at these three areas that we again see very often as the top gaps for some of the companies we assess culture in. For the first one, for establishing that critical visibility of risks with leaders, we, we ran these executive workshops. 
And it's a very structured program over four weeks. And this is one area where COVID-19 is really working for us because the way that we learn, uh, if it's structured really well, uh, can be much more effective than if we get people in the room for a couple of days and run these workshops. This particular executive uh, format that we use for this company was one where, again, four weeks, everybody had about 60 minutes of uh, pre-work before each session. Then they went into a group session, all executives together for two hours. And then they had a bit of homework where they had to now carry the message into their functions and teams. So we ran this for four weeks. Uh, we also looked at how could we develop this guiding coalition that I mentioned, or this team that really lies awake at night and worry about culture of food safety all the time. And we decided to focus in on, on this HACCP team becoming that guiding coalition. And they sat through again a four week program, it was all virtual, 30 minute sessions, they would do in-plant homework. So this was not a matter of going out uh, individually and do HACCP courses, but it was really in the, uh, in the uh, factory with their HACCP team members that they went through these sessions over a four week period. There's a big focus on norms. So that means that instead of saying that food safety uh, HACCP team meetings is about a food safety and quality manager um, being the report out beacon of how are we doing, the, the norm that they wanted to develop in this case was one where everybody is expected to come to the table with updating on the hazards and risks in their area, for example, maintenance or production. And it was a discussion-based meeting, not a report out meeting. Those were some of the norms that they decided to change. And then finally, it's all about team learning. So Mike said collaboration before. In this case, it was very much about bringing the HACCP team to life by having team learnings within them. Then where it, I mentioned rhythm, so setting up a rhythm for ongoing nudging and for recognition of performance. And we ran this, uh, we've done that in a number of companies where it's a rhythm that spans from CEO to frontline and how they communicate and recognize others for their food safety culture. Um, in this case, there was a monthly message from CEOs. There's a quarterly uh, recognition that would come from CEO and also frontline. Executives would have this every third week, a, a dashboard review and see how the change plan was doing. And again, quarterly review, recognition, and course correction. So it's a little bit of a PVCA cycle for those of you that, uh, that uh, use that nomenclature. The middle management was very much engaged in the weekly plan leadership dashboard and change plan discussions, daily supervisory discussions. And again, we had that feedback loop. The front line, very dependent on the daily toolbox talks, and then again, quarterly review. So there's a message that flows throughout the organization on this case, in this case, the, the plants, the three plants, and then back up through the review process. So we did the executive workshops. We worked on uh, the HACCP team as a guiding coalition through the four week learning program, and then also is, uh, implemented the, the rhythm with them. And then we came back in November. So uh, a good six months later, or sorry, five months later and did a remeasure. And they had uh, seen some quite significant improvement within the HACCP proficiency of, of the HACCP teams alone. And this uh, is quite remarkable because yes, we did work with them on the, the um, establishing the coalition, but they also saw how uh, food safety was now part of the rhythm and the executives had gone through some learning programs as well. And we moved the proficiency level up to 59 to 83% for these three plants. This company has set a 60% minimum target for their proficiency level. I think, so I wanted to share this case with you today because I think we think often enough that when we go and focus on food safety culture, we have to come up with something new. And I think we can easily get in a situation where we're getting all teamed out in our food factories. So finding a way to uh, continuously improve on existing teams using some of the programs like HACCP uh, to really bring risks to our front line, uh, from our front line to our senior leadership. I think that's a big part of also protecting the consumers that Mike was talking uh, about before, and at the same time, creating improvement to your, to your food business. 
So we're going to shift gears a little bit to uh, the final gear in our equation here, Mike, and that's around the regulator. And there's certainly been lots of, of movement on this particular field, I would say. Um, I'm going to quickly just uh, take you a little bit through a, a timeline here, because um, while we're speaking a lot of food safety culture today, it's certainly not something that's entirely new. Um, 2012, the Food Standards Agency came out with their first toolkit number one, um, and there's some, some really good content in there. It didn't necessarily get embedded into regulation in the UK, but it was, uh, it was a, a lot of work that went into it. The Canadians, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, uh, worked through their Safe Food for Canadians, and there's a, a big risk characterization component in there that really uh, is there to also influence culture and also give feedback on culture for Canadian food businesses. If food Standards Agency um, in Australia and New Zealand um, started very much a grassroots uh, working group in 2019 where there's ongoing engagement with industry as a, a regulator as well. Then we have this, uh, all this work that happened in, I'm going to say, 2020-21. Um, Dairy Food Safety Victoria, again in Australia, developed a whole new system for them to assess their licensees. And then, of course, uh, the reason why we're here today, the Food Standards Agency in Ireland, um, Pamela and, and team and the strategy that came up was the first one that really, uh, decided where you had specific content where it's not just about regulators looking out at those that are being regulators, but it's also about the regulator looking internally. And I, I think that's very admirable um, that it's an acknowledgement there, a little bit like, I think it was, was the Winston Churchill that like to say, be the change you want to see, and maybe it was Freud or Einstein or somebody that was far, far more um, uh, on the ball than I will ever be. But um, I think that's uh, really, I'm looking forward, Pam, Pamela, to see um, how this evolves for, for FSA AI. It's a, it's a wonderful move forward. Codex, we, we saw the movement of the general principles of food hygiene now having a specific component of food safety culture. And I'll just highlight a couple of thoughts for you there. And the uh, Food and Drug Administration, Mike, is going to talk a little bit more about that as for what happened with uh, new food, new era smart or uh, smarter food safety um, the, the the final thing on this timeline is really where we're looking to what's so what are some of the um, the food standards agency doing with in the new world so they we've done a little bit of work and cultivate with them to revamp the toolkit and all, of course what we're all waiting to see is what uh, is going to happen when a, a EC 852 is going to influence what we do every day uh, with the regulations on food safety culture. A little bit on that note, um, I mentioned Codex and EC 852, for, they're very similar in, in um, language and I'm not expecting any of you to be able to uh, read this in, in detail and we're not gonna go through it in detail, but I want to just highlight couple of similarities in here to the definition that we developed with the FSI. Um, the both codex and uh, EC852 really highlighting this notion of all, um, that it's about creating change where all personnel are engaged in food safety, where all personnel um, are aware of the importance and also that all persons have access to communication and are part of that in the form of their roles and responsibility and authority. So I think, again, very exciting to see what this amounts to. Um, I was doing some work with the Danish government just recently on this point to say, how are we going to address this? And um, I think we can all expect there to be change for sure. But so more to come on, um, and, and it's exciting times on that. Mike, uh, help us uh, just understand a little bit where FDA is moving from and to on this, if you don't mind. Be happy to do that. Um, I'm, I'm a little shy about speaking for Frank Yanis about his uh, leadership and initiatives at FDA on food safety culture. So I, I'm not speaking for Frank, but I, uh, he's a great colleague and friend. And, and um, you know, it's lovely to be in sync with Frank and for Frank to be there at FDA working on food safety culture. Um, I also just want to emphasize that the US perspective is the US perspective. And, and when you think about culture, necessarily you have to recognize that it's a human thing and different uh, 
uh, cultures, social cultures, uh, regions will will have different takes on it. So I don't mean to suggest anything that FDA or the U.S. is doing is necessarily the template, but you know there is some experience there. Um, you know, and the, I think the the first thing I want to say is just how significant I think it is that Europe and Codex, you know, national you know level governments are recognizing. Uh, the important role of, of food safety, formalize of, of culture, and, and formalizing an expectation about culture. You know, FDA is, I think, through its new era uh, initiative, is on that pathway. Um, and and I think you know this this focus, I is is almost a bigger shift in in the history of food safety in my mind as the one that took place post Jack in the Box, where really the community was was awoken to the need to systematically prevent. Uh, contamination with, with pathogens. And now 25 years later, as I indicated earlier, we've got a consensus on that. How do we actually do it? And for regulators to acknowledge that, yes, it's about the right regulatory standard. Yes, it's about inspection and compliance, but it's also about what happens, as, as Loan said, you know, what happens when nobody's looking? You know, how are people behaving? How are people motivated to do the right thing every day? How are they empowered to do that? And from a regulator standpoint, and I know from my own experience visiting I don't know how many scores and scores of food facilities during the FISMA implementation process. It, it, you could tell <laughs> the companies that really were forward leaning, the ones who were wanting to find listeria in their operations, as opposed to being you know, satisfied to provide negative results forever and, and thinking maybe that you know, actually it's not there. This from a regulator standpoint, this, this, this sense that companies really are getting it on food safety and have a culture that that ensures that the right things are happening and nobody is looking is from a regulator standpoint, you know, a very important asset, a very important value and can be a guide to, to, to regulatory behavior. So this graphic is just a way to indicate that food safety culture is right there with improved prevention techniques, improved outbreak response techniques, improved traceability, um, you know, looking in new ways at the retail sector and particularly the home delivery sector, all these forward-looking aspects of the food safety. Food safety culture is one of the four pillars uh, at FDA, and I think it's, it's, a, it's a terrific thing. They, they are um, focusing both on food safety culture within FDA and in the regulated community. And so, again, I think this is crucially important. You know, FDA employees come to work, you know, in the food safety program because they care about food safety. Uh, but they're human beings, too, and they need to have the support and the awareness and the the reinforcement and empowerment to be living in a in their own personal way a strong food safety culture. So, just for example, one of the things that FDA is is doing, and this is the, the leadership of their field force, the Office of Regulatory Affairs, they're they're developing and will be providing in the coming year uh, food safety culture training for over a thousand of their um, uh, of their people. And uh, again, we consider that to be you know. A, a, a sign of FDA really taking food safety culture seriously internally. But FDA is also collaborating. And again, we're gratified that FDA has very much bought into the collaborative model that is what the Alliance is all about. Um, and we're actually partnering with FDA um, in a number of different areas, uh, uh, one of which is training. Actually, Stop Foodborne Illness is part of the team that's been contracted uh, for, along with Alone, who's a central part of the team. and, and um, uh, uh, NC State University, uh, Ben Chapman, who's actually also the chairs the board of, of our of STOP. We're, we're working with FDA to, in designing this training. And so again, very collaborative approach by FDA on training. FDA is also committed to outreach to the community. And, and so another area where we're able to collaborate with FDA is on a webinar series that was launched just earlier this month. It will be a quarterly webinar uh, in the coming couple of years um, in which with in input from experts like loan, from people in companies who are working the food safety culture problem. How can we uh, identify gaps in programs, learn from those, and then share solutions uh, so people can continue to, to improve their food safety culture uh, programs. So, and again, this is a, a joint FDA stop uh, sponsored uh, webinar series, and we're, we're grateful to be able to do that. And, and lastly, I'll mention one initiative that we've been doing under the Alliance banner Again, with FDA involvement, but with other uh, industry colleagues, uh, alliance members, but also uh, Consumer Brand Association, which is our major food industry trade association, um, is, is recall modernization. And this is not 
necessarily, I mean, and what, and what we did was develop a plan, some proposals for improving recall effectiveness so that consumers would be more likely to be contacted, would be more likely to have the information that they need to have to protect themselves in a recall situation. And likewise, for the government to be able to follow up more effectively on recalls using modern information tools. And this was where, under the Alliance umbrella and working with FDA, we were able to sort of show food safety culture in action, you know, because this, this is work that's going above and beyond what the regulatory system requires, but it's, it's, it's work that in a strong food safety culture is, is important uh, to protecting consumers. So um, again, we're, we're enthused that FDA is, is on it in this way. Um, one thing that I will close with is, is the observation that I, I'm sure many of you are interested in, and, and you may have heard you know, Frank Giannis emphasize this, is they're not out to directly regulate food safety culture programs, um, but they are out to really understand food safety culture on a firm level, company to company basis and incorporate knowledge about food safety culture in designing their risk-based risk -based management system. FDA has a number of ways, as you know, in which they try to target inspections, both the frequency of inspection and the manner of inspection in ways that take account of, of risk um, uh, and, and they want, they're going to incorporate, they intend to incorporate uh, culture and what they can assess about company cultures in how they uh, design their, their uh, risk-based inspection program. So again, I think that's an opportunity for companies who, are, who are, have strong food safety cultures uh, because FDA knows that you know, it, it, it needs to spend perhaps more time with companies who don't have such strong food safety cultures. So you know, how, how do, you know, how does FDA without regulating culture directly incentivize strong food safety cultures in the way in which it conducts its, uh, its risk-based inspections program? I think there's, there's work to be done as they implement that, but I think that's a promising uh, part of what FDA is, is doing as, as well. So let me stop there. I probably overextended my stay on that one. So. I don't think so, Mike. There's, uh, there's uh, some great uh, learnings to be had across regulators, I'm sure. I'm just going to quickly just round out um, our regulatory discussion with version 2.0 that is in the Food Standards Agency toolkit as we work through that with their inspectors, etc. cetera. Um, there was three things that we saw that needed to improve. Um, it was really about getting the stakeholders involved in developing the testing. And I think this is a critical piece that we can learn both in, from a, a regulatory perspective as for how inspectors are included in what food safety culture is and what their role is in it, but also in businesses, how do we include our stakeholders in finding solutions, solving for problems so that it's not something that is given to them, but that they're part of coming up with. The second part that we found was that uh, it really had to complement the Food Standards Agency systems that were already in place. So the um, formal system requirements, such as confidence in management and safety, better business that the FSA has in place. So it's not an additional, it's not a new program. It's something that complements the programs that FSA already has. And that was a really key point for the change to really um, provide the results that we're hoping for. The third one was, and I go back to this notion around norms again, um, norms uh, had to be defined and described in the maturity continuum. So we developed a maturity model uh, within the Food Standards Agency toolkit um, that via machine learning can be used for inspectors and public health officers as they go out and work with businesses to drive uh, ongoing focus and uh, improvement around culture and food safety. So I think these were just three great learnings that as we uh, more and more regulators and businesses are taking a, a really active role in their culture and food safety that uh, remembering having the stakeholders involved, making sure that it's complementing our existing programs and systems. It's not always about something new. It's about doing something a little different with what we already have. And then bringing in the notion of norms, those informal rules that influence how we act that are really founded and accepted in groups and therefore make up the basis of what we see as culture in our organizations and um and influence what we do for food safety as well. So I just wanted to bring that up. FSA is obviously on a journey to figuring out what to do with their toolkit longer term, but we do have a, a peer review paper coming out with this work and also a report from FSA early in the new year. Um, we're going to round out um, our session here and 
and really just in closing, I just want to share a story from a wonderful company that we work with called Bulla Dairy. And uh, Bulla is one of these, um, one, it's one of these brands that families bring home every day and enjoy uh, because they make, I tell you, some of the best ice cream in the world. And I'm sorry if I'm offending anybody by saying that, but they are absolutely marvelous in what they do. They've also been on a very, very significant journey as for how they have improved their culture of food safety over the last four years. And it started by measuring. And now they're at the point where they're having in-depth discussions with where their head of marketing is the one that's taking on how do we craft what we see and everybody latches on to as our values. And they came up with this wonderful tagline, food safety, I care, I own. And it's everybody at Buller that has access to understanding what that means that I care, I own in my particular role. We just rounded out a series of executive workshops with them and my goodness, are they ever engaged. Uh, and they're engaged because they want to make sure that every single person that works on their line in their dairy factories um, understand what to do with food safety and how they in the everyday role influence what's going on for food safety. And I really respect them for their effort. And I know that many of you out there on similar type journeys and when the going gets tough a little bit because it is a long time journey to improve your food safety culture over the long run, make sure that you reach out to those other colleagues in the industry and businesses that are on a similar track, uh, track for improving so that you can collaborate and we can all learn from each other because only then can we make sure that one day stop, stop might not be needed. We might not have to have uh, our concerns as consumers as to what's going on with our food every day. With that, I'm going to hand it back over to Suzanne and um, um, Mike, I'm, uh, I'm gonna say thank you on our behalf um, and thank you so much for, for your time today. And uh, especially thanks to, uh, to Pamela uh, for the kind introduction or for the kind invitation and to, to Ray for, for having us part of the, the event today. Thank you. Thank you, Lone and Mike. That was absolutely fascinating. You've given us really good insights there on how we can work together to develop a food culture we can all be proud of. And in the next section, we will hear from Brian Highland, who will discuss food safety culture from an Irish multinational food business perspective. Hello, and thank you for inviting me today to discuss our food safety culture at Dawn Meats. My name is Brian Highland, and I am the Group Director for Food Safety, Quality and Animal Welfare. The group has 22 processing facilities across the UK and Ireland, and we employ over 7,500 people. Our food safety culture journey, like any journey, has its origins, which began with a brainstorming event back in 2016. And that journey has continued to the present day and beyond. It's a journey that has been marked with several milestones along the way, and that is what I want to present to you all today. The road we have traveled has had its challenges, but our teams have risen to those challenges and found innovative and exciting ways to deliver the message that a strong food safety culture is the way we do things around here. So I would now like to take you on that journey of where we started, our commitment, how we communicate the message, deliver on our objectives, engage our colleagues and recognize the positive food safety behaviors that that delivers. Our first task was to collectively agree as a company what our food safety vision and mission was to be. Our colleagues within the food safety teams across our entire business contributed to this process. We didn't just want to be good at food safety, we wanted to be great at it. In the end, our message was quite simple and clear. We set out to be recognized by our stakeholders as having an industry leading culture of food safety, quality, technical innovation and animal welfare. This was just the beginning of our journey. The culture of any business is determined by what can be described as the difference in what is acceptable and what is unacceptable behaviours. And this message must be driven and delivered from the top down. It's always easier to push down than pull up. The benefits of a good food safety culture are engaged people, happy customers and brand protection, to name but a few. It came as no surprise that the commitment to deliver on our mission and vision was fully supported by our board and that food safety was front and center and had a voice at that table. 
The work on turning our vision into a reality is made all the easier when you have the commitment to resourcing and delivering on that vision. Our communication initially ranged from posters on food safety notice boards that detailed our mission and vision statement so that our staff awareness would improve. Slideshows on TV screens within our staff amenities were used to explain what our vision was and how it would take all our colleagues from all departments to make this vision a reality. We made use of the company intranet system and within the communities section, we set up our own food safety group as a place we could share information, post pictures, notices, etc. It was our Instagram, our Facebook page, it was ours. We quickly found other methods to communicate our cultural journey through a newsletter that was sent to all colleagues and each staff member was provided with a lanyard swipe card holder with our mission stated on the back. A further brainstorming event took place across our food safety teams from which evolved the concept of a series of days dedicated to various food safety initiatives that was collectively known as Food Safety Week. This was our first showpiece to focus all our colleagues across 20 manufacturing sites delivering the same message. Our vision was becoming a reality. The journey was well underway. Food Safety Week became an annual event across the business where we celebrated the success of the year gone by and launched our plans for the year ahead. It was a way of doing this by engaging with every employee in the business as well as customers and suppliers. Whilst Food Safety Week was and is a success, it was an event to showcase how committed the business was to food safety, but we needed to ensure we had the right culture every day. So we decided to carry out a survey across our workforce on their understanding of what our company culture and food safety meant to them. To ensure consistency of approach, we engaged a suitably qualified third party expert to conduct the confidential survey and interpret the results. When you ask questions of people, it is essential that you not only listen to the answers, but that you properly access the answers. Through our food safety surveys, we were able to identify things we were doing very well. We were able to identify that on a lot of the areas examined, we had some very positive feedback. We also had several areas in which we were not doing as well as we had thought. Engagement with all the workforce and making them all feel part of the food safety journey was an area where improvement was required. Recognition of individuals on an ongoing basis for going above and beyond was also something that was highlighted in the could do better column. The big takeaway from the first food safety culture survey carried out was the need to have site specific food safety culture plans. These plans set out a series of annual objectives that each site would deliver to their colleagues. Our culture in relation to food safety was being measured by using detailed third party surveys of our teams following a documented site by site plan based on the feedback. Progress was then assessed by repeating the surveys and measuring progress. Communication with staff increased hugely. Recognition became an ongoing process. All ideas and concepts were shared between sites as part of a best practice culture sharing initiative. We have used a variety of methods to engage our colleagues in initiatives that encourage a food safety culture. These range from word searches, quizzes, interactive games such as spotting hazards like physical contaminants or allergens. The more fun you make it, the more people will engage. Things like the UV light hand washing challenge is a great way of showing the consequences of poor hand hygiene culture. It's through activities like this that we have found people are able to make the link, sometimes subconsciously, between the key steps in their daily work routine and in their own lives. When we speak of allergen controls, we always ask the group about family members who have had allergenic reactions. When we speak of the cold chain, we also reference the domestic refrigerator. When we speak of cross-contamination, we always speak of the domestic chopping board. We ensure that people are always making the link between the critical food safety steps within the factory environment and their own homes. When people can always make the link between the food they are producing and the food that they and their families are consuming, it makes everything else fall into place a lot easier. From our survey feedback, this approach has made a huge positive impression with our people. When there is no consequence for poor work ethic and no reward for good work ethic, then there is no motivation. The same can be said for culture. The recognition of positive food safety culture initiatives for teams and individuals ensure that our colleagues' engagement in the process is rewarded and beneficial to their needs. At Dawn Meets, we have an award for food safety for the best performing site in our business based on several KPIs. 
Individuals are shortlisted for going above and beyond in food safety. Nominations are sought, and these include colleagues from all departments who have improved food safety at their sites, and in some cases have improved it across our entire group. We have free breakfast for sites that achieve their audit KPIs, ice cream Fridays and barbecue packs of our own products to share with our families and friends over the grill. Across the group, our food safety team run quizzes and events monthly on topics of interest on food safety with prizes such as shopping vouchers, temperature probes, color coded chopping boards and other items that encourage food safety outside of the workplace and into their homes. This continues to keep the link between food safety in the workplace and in people's own communities. Most of our journey in food safety culture has been smooth, but all journeys have had a few bumps along the way, and this one has been no different. Like many organizations, there will always be some challenges that give us a choice, either give up or navigate the rough seas and seek out new opportunities to get our messages heard. COVID has changed how we interact with each other on a personal level as well as in group settings. Food businesses are coping with ongoing labour challenges. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. We had come far enough in this journey not to give back, <clears throat> not to give up or to turn back. It was time to innovate and look at the best available technology we had to continue to engage our colleagues from all walks of life. And that technology was at our fingertips, the phone, the computer. Instead of pen and paper, we used QR codes and scanners on mobile phones. We used interactive virtual stands to continue to communicate our vision to colleagues working from home and customers who could no longer attend our sites. We hosted webinar events and developed pictorial guides and translated key food safety messages into the numerous languages of our colleagues to ensure we catered for our whole audience. Our journey continues. What are the key lessons we have learned on our journey to date and what advice would we give to others? A business needs to have a commitment and vision for a great food safety culture. The vision needs to be shared with the entire workforce, but it also needs to be constantly reinforced from the top down. You need to listen to everybody in the business, ask people for their opinions, ask difficult questions and listen to the answers and feedback, even if you don't like what has been said. Engage with everybody, Find new and innovative ways to engage with people and make it easy for them to understand the importance of doing the right thing all the time. The culture plan needs to evolve all the time to keep pace with the evolving workplace and its challenges. The importance of having a good culture of food safety in a business cannot be underestimated. It means that employees can come and go, but the culture will persist and it will be greater than any individual. But if you have a poor culture, the opposite will be true. It takes constant work, care, attention to promote a culture of excellence, but it is the best investment of effort a business can ever make. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. That was actually really interesting what you've seen there in Dawn Meats. And we're going to return to that in terms of putting a food culture, food safety culture into your business. Just before we go to the panel discussion, we're going to put a poll on screen for everybody that's partaking today. The question in the poll, if you'd like to answer it, is have you taken formal steps to develop a food safety culture in your business? The answer is yes or no, of course, and we'll give you the results in a little bit. But we're now going to go to our panel discussion. And we have on links, we have Ray Bow, Chair of the Food Safety Consultative Council and Head of Food Safety and Quality Musgrave Group. We heard from Ray earlier on. And Lone Jesperson, who we heard from also, she will be part of our panel from Cultivate Food Safety. Mike Taylor will also be joining us from Stop Foodborne Illness, obviously former Deputy Commissioner for Foods and Veterinary Medicine at the US Food and Drug Administration. And in studio here I have Gail Carroll, Director of Regulatory Affairs and Compliance from the FSAI, and Brian Highland, who you saw there in the video, um, Food Safety, Quality and Animal Welfare Director, Dawn Meats Group. Now, I'd just like to go back to the, your video presentation there, um, Brian. Like, how difficult was it to embed that food safety culture? culture? And a lot of people might be asking, did it cost? Um, I, I think the hardest part was the realisation that we needed to raise our game, mm. that regulatory compliance alone was, was not enough um, and that we needed to go above and beyond when it came to food safety. Once, once we had made that decision and 
the fact we got complete support from our board and our CEO, it, it made everything else easy thereafter. Um, and I think that that was probably one of the refreshing things over the last five years is that once our, our new way of working was rolled out to our teams, people across all the sites um, just picked up the baton and ran with it. And it, it almost became competitive um, within sites and within the teams as to who was going to have the best initiatives and who was going to go the furthest when it came to food safety. So, so I think, yeah, the start maybe is difficult, but I think thereafter, um, it, it's a lot more costly not mm -hmm. to have a, a proper food safety culture in place. Mm -hmm. Were there any real challenges, real barriers as you went along that you could you know, say to other companies watching here, you know, we made a little mistake doing this or don't spend too long doing that with it. What were the learnings from it you'd take forward? Um, I, I, I think what would have been one of the biggest challenges would be if we didn't have the support from the top. But what we did was we put together a very compelling presentation as a department to outline what could go wrong if we didn't have the proper culture in place. And then we went and we made that presentation to, to the board and to our CEO. Um, and, and from that moment forward, we, we had them hooked. So rather than starting from the bottom up, we started from the top down and the bottom up simultaneously and kind of met in the middle. So I, I think that would be probably our, our best learning is, is make sure that you have complete buy-in from all aspects of the business before you begin the journey. And once you have that, it makes everything else a lot easier. Okay, it makes a lot of sense. Um, we might go to you, Ray, with, with a similar question. What changes did, have you made to, to date in Musgrave? And one thing I picked up from Loan, Loan's presentation there, that narrowing the gap between senior management and frontline staff, were you able to, to do that successfully? Yeah, we're, we're on that journey, uh, I, I would say, um, and on a continuous basis. Um, but I think the, what the, what's been important for us is having that clarity of message from the, from the CEO and the support from senior management all the way through the organization. And that's probably been the biggest thing for us that we continue to work on and develop uh, and, and, uh, and probably paint that picture for the rest of the business uh, of what good looks like you know, from a food safety perspective. Um, but we've done a number of things in the last number of years, um, one of which was completely overhauling our in internal retail food safety program. And uh, that, that really refers to how we audit, how we assess our retail or so, retail stores and sites. Um, but in particular, from a food safety culture perspective, uh, we now audit that. That's one of the audit points on our program, uh, which we wouldn't have done before. Uh, and in a similar way, we also when we conduct supplier audits, particularly on brand supplier audits, uh, we now include an assessment of food safety culture in there as well. Um, so it's a journey for us. Uh, we're, we're still there. But I think uh, for me, the important part is to ensure that everybody in the business realizes in some way, directly or indirectly, they're part of the food safety uh, department, essentially, whether they have food safety in their title or not. And, and that's encapsulated in some expressions that we use when we are promoting it, such as food safety is starts with me. And the, the me can be anybody in our organization, whether they're frontline staff or our CEO. And, and we really live and, and uh, work by that uh, mantra uh, very much in, as well. But, um, but I, I think it's a journey for us where we've, we've adopted many of the principles of food safety culture, but we're aware of it. And we're aware of the other cultures we can have in a business of our size, but essentially uh, driving that from the top down. And uh, again, that support is really essential for us as well. And uh, we're making good progress, I'm happy to say. Okay, thanks, Ray. We have the results in of our poll. The question that we asked to everyone who's um, engaging with us today was, have you taken formal steps to develop a food safety culture in your business? And predictably and thankfully, the answer is an overwhelming yes. 82% said yes, and 18% said no. So we might talk about the no's later on. But anyway, um, if you're watching and engaging as well, please put questions into the chat, and we will employ them in the debate as we go along as well. Um, a question for you, Gail. You're obviously working with the FSAI. It's great to hear those positives, and, and businesses really engaging with a food safety culture and this notion and really living it, not just talking about it, because it has to be real. Um, but Pamela mentioned in her opening yeah. remarks that, you know, as a regulator, you've found businesses that have really negative or bad food safety cultures. 
Can you tell us what that looks like in a business? Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. And um, I suppose we have about 50,000 food businesses in Ireland and the vast majority of them are compliant. And, and when they find a problem, they fix it and they work with the regulator to fix it. So that's that's great news. We do have a small number of cases um, and had some very serious ones over the last couple of years where biz with businesses where clearly food safety hasn't mattered in, mattered in the business. And that's that's what it's, I suppose is really about. Um, is food safety mattering. So we've heard a lot today and, and great stories about the importance of the leadership, the management, the tone from the top. So in the cases where there's been the most serious food safety issues and that poor or bad food safety culture, we've seen a really poor tone from the top. So for example, uh, management actively directing uh, non-compliance and um, in some cases falsifying rules or showing a set of records to their inspector or their auditor that gives the illusion of a, of a food safety culture when in fact it's not authentic or it's, it's fake. Also, we've seen cases of a culture of fear in the organisation where uh, staff on the ground or middle management have been afraid to report problems or food safety problems. Um, and uh, that, that's been something that we've seen quite a lot in businesses that have the poorest food safety culture. Um, the other weaknesses that we've seen um, are in relation to communication and so one of the messages uh, from today and Brian has spoken about and Ray and other uh, and Lone and, and Mike is um, having systems for report where, where staff can report food safety problems, open communication channels within a business. And that really is, is a key thing for businesses to do that will promote food safety and that culture in a business. Um, third broad area is in relation to not on businesses not understanding the risks associated with what they're doing. So, for example, um, a business who makes a significant change in, in, in how they're producing food without understanding that there's now a change in the risk to consumers. So, for example, if a business started cooking food that they hadn't done before without properly assessing uh, and understanding that and changing their food safety management system. Um, and we've also recently saw a case where um, there was a serious breach in a business and um, uh, an enforcement order was issued to the management and when the inspectors went back in a follow up visit, the staff didn't know about this problem, they hadn't been communicated about this food, serious food safety problem and how to fix it. So that's just a couple of examples Suzanne, but really I suppose the tone from the top and that management approach is, is really key um, and making sure food safety is, is, is just a, a priority throughout the organisation. Now, I know like businesses have had so many challenges with the, the pandemic and, and we're still in those challenges, both in food service and manufacturing businesses like Brian's, you know, has food safety slipped to a degree? Do you need to refocus people, let alone add in this new kind of, you know, more a, a bigger enmeshment of it in our in our terms of our thinking in terms of food safety culture? It's, it's obviously challenging times. Absolutely. Um, it's very challenging for businesses dealing with all of this extra mm. uh, protocols and safety around COVID. And yeah, and, and being for many for many of our businesses been closed for long periods of time, and that puts pressure on businesses. So we we do understand that. But I suppose uh, Pamela said in her in her opening, if it's not safe, it's not food. There can't be any day off from food safety. Food safety has to matter all the time, regardless of what other challenges are going mm -hmm. on in a business. And actually, during the lockdown last year. And 30% of the consumer queries to our advice line were uh, complaints about food safety hygiene in businesses. So there's a really good awareness and growing awareness among consumers as to what they see as a bad food safety culture in a business. So I think, uh, and, and last year we had a very large number of queries from industry, many, probably in many cases when the companies were closed and they had time. Uh, so I think the, the during uh, it, with all of these challenges going on, there's been time for companies maybe to reflect mm -hmm. and to do some work around food safety, maybe that they hadn't had time before. So because there, there can't be there can't be a slippage uh, no matter what challenges are going on in a yes, business. Yes, exactly. Um, Lone, I might bring you in here. Your um, presentation it was so interesting and so broad ranging. How does this this idea of food safety culture? impact the global food industry, which, which you're dealing with. Thank you very much, Susanne. And um, I have to apologize for, for a little bit of the background noise here. Um, I think we have to look at that food safety culture is really um, forcing businesses into becoming more rigorous, but also considering food safety as just part of doing business. And I think those are the two things that, that it really impacts. We saw it from Brian's story. Brian, thank you so much for sharing a really enlightening and thorough story for, for, from your company, that it's really driving that food safety becomes 
a part of doing business every day. And we say that and it, we've never sort of really, I think, put what does that feel and look like behind it? And I think Brian illustrated that beautifully where food safety is built into some of those just general practices of what it means to run a manufacturing company. So you have your recognition programs that anybody has in place, but we might not always have thought about building food safety into it. You have your um, compensation policies. How does food safety influence that? What about your technology decisions that when you go out and look for innovative uh, solutions from a technology perspective, how does food safety get in, in, included into that? So I think, Suzanne, there's the, the simple answer to say that we just become more and more aware of building food safety into those business critical decisions and the everyday actions that we're taking as well. Then I think we also have to, and Mike and I sort of provocatively to some put this into a title of our talk that is about improving, improving business. I think we'll come to a crossroad candidly. So Gail, I appreciate that there's still some, some companies that need you and the FSAI to, to make sure that food safety is brought to the forefront. But at some point in time, it's going to become a competitive advantage. I know we don't think of food safety as a competitive advantage, but I think it's fair to say that food safety culture will become one where it's about those that have the strong and most proactive and preventative cultures. It will also be the ones that retailers and others will have more trust in, like Pam said it in the opening as well, that it's about trustworthiness, isn't it? So I very much see that we're starting to see a split in companies, those that are in at paying attention to food safety culture because they want to improve businesses and they want to improve public health. And those that are uh, focusing on food safety culture candidly because they're putting a check in the box of a, an external audit or an inspection from a regulator. And um, that's, I think that's where we're at today, Suzanne, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes an awful lot of sense. I mean, you have very demanding consumers who want you know, assurances all the time. I mean, Brian, this is very relevant to Dawn Meats. You know, I suppose in Ireland, we sell food to 180 countries. So we have such a strong record in food safety. We have those consumers only because we have such an amount of regulation from farm to fork, you know, and in manufacturing. Like, Brian, it's, I suppose, is it a competitive advantage to have a food safety culture that's very strong, very visible? Um, I, I think it's it's absolutely a competitive advantage, but I, I kind of go a step further. It's 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 a must. Um, it's 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 just there's there's too much at stake and there's too much of a risk. Um, you only have one reputation and you only have one chance at this. And if you make one mistake, people are very unforgiving, and and you could spend a lifetime trying to recover from it. So, so I I, I think you could call it a competitive advantage, but you could call it a prerequisite to, to do business nationally or internationally. Um, and, and I think that there is no second chances. Yes, yes. Um, speaking of, I suppose, the experience in the US, Mike, um, you were talking about the impact of those that very big E. coli outbreak on children, on families, and how you engaged with that. Um, what do you think the learning from what do you think the learnings are, the, the actions that the US is taking at the moment, or the challenges in terms of food safety culture? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, I think the, the, the very positive thing that's happening is that, that there's such greater awareness now of food safety culture um, and a recognition that there's that it's a win-win-win proposition that 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 consumers have a big stake in it and, and, and obviously because they need safe food companies have a big stake in it as we've been discussing already I mean the value of culture for just the success of the business and I like the concept Brian of it being a prerequisite uh, and 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 government has a big stake in food safety culture and and as evidenced by what governments around the world are are doing because again uh, they they know that they can inspect and do compliance actions all day long, but if if companies aren't doing the right thing every day, that that's for naught. So I think, you know, I think that's what's gratifying about what's what's going on. I, I think the the thing that is a, will be a continuing challenge, um, just from things that I've sort of observed, is that um, you know, and I sort of pick up on this point about the the importance of CEO level, top level support and, and leadership, not just, and this is the key point I wanna make, not just voicing all the right things you can voice about food safety culture, the importance of, of food safety, but actual decisions <laughs> uh, that business leaders have to make in running their business that where, 
where it becomes evident whether food safety really is a core primary value or, or, or not, because um, you know, it comes up all the time, you know, where companies uh, have to decide what investments to make in their systems, their sanitation systems, their facilities. Um, you know, they, they have to uh, decide what kind of technology they're willing you know, to, to, to invest in. Um, they've got to decide, um, you know, that decide that in, in the context of the sort of all the pressures that are on a manufacturing facility, you know, they're, they're economic, that are market driven. And so, so the, the, and, and then you get, you get situations on recalls, you know, where, where, what, you know, how forward leading is the leadership in making a decision about a recall that is airing on the side of protecting consumers. So, I think it's a, you know, I, I, I have a sense from work I've done with companies about the, the pressures that are on business leaders. Um, and, it, and, and so it's gratifying that business leaders are stepping up and saying, you know, we, we get it, we've got to put food safety first, have a strong food safety culture, but it, it's a continuing test, mm. I think, for business leaders to be willing to make the day in, day out decisions about, you know, investing their finite resources, uh, making decisions that can be costly, but are protective of consumers. That's the day in, day out challenge coming from the top. And, and again, that's, that's on top of having to provide the leadership that really does convince everyone working for them that, that, that truly they, will, they are empowered to, to live out a strong food safety culture. So uh, I, I'm, not ha I'm, not, I'm, I'm glad not to be in the shoes of Brian and others who face these things. I think the commitment that Brian displays, the value, you know, it's really values at the end of the day you know how, how do you how do you value the the, it, the welfare of your consumers? Um, uh, the, uh, you know, how do you value the intangible trust that they want to place in you uh, against other values that companies have to face? And um, mm -hmm. so I think this is why, to me, you know, food safety culture is not just something we we do one day <laughs> or we discuss. You know, but it is it is an ongoing. It is just a prerequisite for success of the business. Again, as, as Brian said, and something that I think requires renewed. Yes effort. And I, and I think it's, you know, the, the collaboration, you know, government, industry, and consumers can mutually reinforce each other and support each other in, in making the right decisions. Absolutely. It's, it's a, it's a win-win and there's no way around it. On, on that note, we have a question for you, Brian, um, coming from one of our audience. Was there any challenges faced between corporate stroke global intentions on implementing safety culture and factory facilities on what actually could be implemented? And if yes, was there a strategy you had to overcome those sort of conflicts? I think a lot of people would identify with that who are in food manufacturing businesses. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, and I suppose it's one that, that businesses face every, every day of the week mm. all around the world. Um, and there isn't any easy answer, but, but yes is the answer. There was a conflict from time to time, and there always is. Yeah. Um, as, as, as food safety leaders within our sites and our businesses, we want everything and we want it now. We want all the, the shiny new, new machines that will make things cleaner and better and faster. Um, but sometimes they maybe don't have as quick a payback as, as some operational equipment. But within our business, how, how we overcame it was, was compromise. Um, and if, if, if we made a case and, and it was important enough and, and something was needed and something was essential, um, the business supported it. Um, and and it's, it's it's having respect for your department within the business, but but I think the more important message ab about culture is it's not necessarily about spending vast quantities of money on shiny machines that won't improve your food safety culture. It might give a, a better image to people who look in from the outside, but it's it's how people do their jobs every day, and it's how they do the right thing, and it's what's in their minds. And and I think we focused a lot more on that and getting people to to associate the risks and hazards within the business with their own families and communities so that they were producing food, not just for some mm, distant, distant land and yeah, people in a faraway place. Purpose. They, they were producing it possibly for their own kids, yeah. their brothers, their sisters, their own communities. And, yeah. and, and, and when you instill that mentality into people, you, you make far greater inroads um, than spending vast quantities of money on, on shiny new kids. Yeah. But, but overall, compromise, I think, is the, is the key word. Yeah, and that buy-in. You have to buy in from absolutely everybody in the business. Um, another poll we're going to pop up for everybody who's watching. Um, this time, the question is, um, who benefits more from good food safety culture in a food business? And there's three answers. You can choose the business, the consumer, 
or both indeed you can choose both so we'll see the answer to that in a minute um loving the questions coming in the the hashtag for this event is hashtag fsai events all one word um gail i have another question for you for consumers you know we're all here talking about food safety but we're all everybody in this room and everybody watching we're all consumers as well what should consumers do if they see they're in a place they're not happy with in terms of food service or they're engaging with a manufacturer or a subsidiary or a, a, a group that they see food not being handled correctly is this a sign of poor food safety culture what should they do about it yeah um well consumers i suppose for the fsai are our eyes and ears if you like on, on the ground so um their voice is very important suzanne um it is difficult for a consumer though because um we we've seen um cases where you can have a a lovely exterior um but that doesn't mean that the culture behind it is right but where consumers do see problems things are not happy with poor hygiene um they're not happy with the way the food is handled they should report in the business but they um we have an advice line and we love to hear from consumers i, I mentioned earlier we had about three thousand calls to our advice line last year okay. so um all of those uh, complaints are followed up on um, by inspectors followed up in the premises so consumers should should let us know and we will follow up but i i think we it's it's really um consumers shouldn't have we shouldn't be relying on consumers for that it's a legal responsibility for the businesses to produce safe food um and there's a trust when in ireland when a, when a consumer buys a product or um engages with the food industry there's a trust there and uh, the businesses have to take that trust seriously and we've heard today lots about how if the trust is broken um, that's really really hard to regain so we can't uh, consumers can play their part but we really need it's, it's really lies with the business to 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 fulfill their their obligation mm, okay um i have a question here kind of i'll, I'll shorten it but the, the general gist of it is it might be easy to do this in big national multinational companies. What if you're trying to downscale these principles to a smaller business? Um, I'm trying to help the company I work for approve, uh, uh, implement a proper food safety culture, but it's very challenging. Any guidance or starting points would be appreciated. What would you suggest? So uh, f first of all, I uh, just to come back to your poll. It was great to hear that 82%, I think, of, of businesses mm -hmm. who are who were listening today have started on the food safety journey. So that's fantastic. The legislation is uh, only a requirement of EU law since March of this year. So it, we are early in the understanding of it. What I will say to businesses, and it is it is challenging for us. Uh, there's different challenges for a small business. Um, if food safety matters to your business at the moment, if um, you have a strong um, food safety tone of food safety led by the management, um, you have a, a robust food safety management system, you have nothing to be concerned about about this new legal requirement on food safety. The FSAI works really closely with food businesses to build compliance. We have lots of free resources on our website. We have uh, advice notes. Uh, free training, guidance, and we have an advice line. I think we answered 7,000, we helped 7,000 businesses last year with questions on food safety. But we also work with um, industry sectors through the Food Safety Consultative Council. And today's uh, theme for today's meeting on culture is a fantastic start so th uh, uh, that the council have led out on. We have food safety fora with the retailers, um, with food service sector artisans, and we also uh, meet and work regularly with um, a lot of different trade bodies. So um, we're, we really want to hear from industry what we can do to help you formally build a culture of compliance within your business. Next year, the FSAI is going to be starting work on development of a regulatory strategy, and we'll be listening to businesses and asking for your views on what you need. We have some great exemplars, and we've heard from some of them today, and there's many others out there who are doing great work in culture. So we will be working over the next while to see what we can do to help you, and, and listening to what businesses tell us um, they need to, to support them in compliance with these new requirements. Okay, very good. Um, Ray, I might throw a question at you. Um, if I'm the owner or manager of my business, what's my responsibility to ensure there is a good food safety culture in my business? I think uh, for me, Suzanne, that there are three things really. Uh, one is that the owner or the, that the person who's running this business is as committed to food safety as everybody else is, in particular, the, the person whose responsibility it is, for example, food safety manager. What can happen is that it's delegated. And uh, when that response is delegated, the owner can feel like that responsibility is being managed. Now. So, so for me, um, 
well, for, uh, whatever size the company is, but particularly when it's a smaller company, it really must be owned from the top. Uh, that, that's by the first thing. Uh, the second is that it must be real and tangible as well within the business. Um, by the same token, a food safety culture can be something that's in a folder. It could be a poster on the wall uh, and it's conveniently referred to many at times when, um, when it's needed. Um, but also, uh, they must also walk the walk. Uh, both the manager, owner, and, and uh, leaders, but also those at the front line. And not just when times are good, but when times are difficult as well, because that's when the culture can really be tested, uh, when there's more challenges than maybe have been anticipated. So, so I, I think it, it's, really, it's really about that leadership, about making it real, and then walking the walk, uh, I think are probably, you know, they're not legislative requirements, they're something about how you want a proper food safety program and uh, I think culture really talks to that as well. Thanks Ray, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, walking the walk, talking the talk as well. And um, we have the results of our second poll. If you remember, we asked you to answer ultimately who benefits more from a good food safety culture in food business. A, the business, B, the consumer or C, both. And unsurprisingly, I think 96% of you said both. Of course they do because it's it's it, it it feeds out to the consumer who is your business at the end of the day um i suppose we have another question here uh i'll just ask you again gail once you have a food safety culture in place once you're engaging with this and i suppose a lot of people engaging with this seminar today are saying okay i'm engaging with it i understand the phrase um but how do you track performance and improvements it's easy to talk about it. it's easy to think you're doing quite well how can you track how well you're doing in practical terms. Yeah, I suppose that's going to be individual to, to every business. Um, and we talked earlier about um, continuously moving ahead with culture. And that's that's one of the, the elements of um, the EU legislation and the codex rules about that, that concept of continuous improvement. So it is it is very important that um, we, we've heard today about um, that, that lots of different concepts of how you can do this you can have staff awareness days you can have different themes um polls or you can set individual metrics to measure so if there's a particular problem in your a food safety problem you can set measures to improve those and track and set targets so i think that's going to be very individual to the business mm -hmm. but i think it's absolutely the space your business should, should be uh, be in and thinking from the staff up middle management, senior management, what are the key food safety issues in that business, being aware of the problems, and that's one of the key requirements of the legislation, being aware of the hazards and the risks associated with your business, and putting in measures to fix those problems and making a really good awareness of them. So I think that's a great, it's a, it's a great question, and I think that's a great space for businesses to be thinking of, how can I set a target and how can I move and communicate on, the, on progress on that target. Okay, setting target. Uh, Ray, another question has come in from one of our audience for you. Um, how do you deal with food safety culture in the multiple businesses that Musgraves engages with, and also in those types of retail businesses where there's a high staff turnover? Two challenges there um, that they'd like your opinion on multiple businesses and also businesses with high staff turnover. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge that we, we regularly deal with, uh, Suzanne. But uh, what I'd say to that is um, the, way, the way we're structured, we have a network of food safety champions that are located in each store. Uh, so each of our retailer um, partners um, must have somebody on site who is competent, qualified, and, uh, and trained in food safety principles. And what we do is we use those um, food safety champions pretty much as ambassadors for the culture that we're trying to create. And um, they then will localize that within their own store. Um, and and that's, that's probably the starting point for us. Uh, we provide them with the materials, with the training programs uh, online and so on as well. So we try to get that message consistently across our network. Um, that's, that's the starting point. Um, the second point uh, that we support that is by ensuring that we have a consistent auditing process that I referred to earlier. Uh, so that, that's done independently and uh, it's an independent benchmark of how the store is performing. And that also um, is building into the culture as well in that we are, we are providing the standard, we are supporting them in achieving the standard, but also we're ensuring that the, the person who's tasked with it locally uh, is trained and competent and has the right to fit to deliver that. Uh, constantly something we're working on um, because we have, we have hundreds of uh, stores in our network 
uh, but I'm happy to say that uh, we do tend to hit that um, hit that middle point pretty well all the time, uh, but it's something we never rest on we continuously try to improve. Uh, on the second question around training, uh, around uh, staff turnover, it's a real thing now, uh, for sure. And I think uh, no matter what industry you're in, whether it's retail or manufacturing, uh, or even not even in food, uh, it's a challenge we're all facing uh, in, these, in these times at the moment. Uh, for us, what's important is that we provide a training program that is uh, robust, and uh, typically it's an online program we use now. So the training can be done remotely, uh, and it can be done very efficiently as well uh, at, the, at the store, at the site in particular. Um, and we found that to be very effective, it's very user friendly, and it doesn't take people out of the business um, for, for too long either. Uh, but it's something we've got to watch for on a continuous basis. It's really important that anybody in our network who's handling food has been trained to do so before they ever get there in the country. And uh, we, we, we take great pains to make sure that happens as well. Uh, but uh, but it's, a, it's ongoing, and we're, we're not, uh, that job is never done, and we're constantly uh, constantly watching what we're doing. Mm, okay, thanks, Ray. I know, Mike, um, we're here, you know, we've huge shortage of staff in food service here in Ireland, also in the UK. I'm hearing it's a big issue in America as well, and also in manufacturing. Do you have ways or did you explore ways of, of reaching staff, making staff more effective around food safety within um, your organization, within STOP, Foodborne Illness? Uh, the way in which STOP contributes to that is, is really working you know, with the company people who have the training responsibilities and uh, the food safety responsibilities and trying to find innovative tools for delivering messages that can motivate and, and you know, and and be just part of the basic training, frankly, of yeah. of new employees. And and certainly from you know we know full well what a challenge it is. Um, you know, particularly at retail food service, you know, the turnover is huge. So again, we we can't you know we we can support companies. We you know obviously don't have any direct access of our own. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a it's a key focus of the whole alliance initiative is to support that human resource problem, you know, challenge of, of continuous turnover of people who need to get the food safety understanding and culture uh, understanding from day one. Mm -hmm. Loan, have you learnings to give us in this world as well, where it's, it's harder to get staff, it's harder to get staff to stay longer, and also you're having to train them. And that is food safety culture, you're trying to imbue them within that and, and, and make them part of that buy-in. What are your tips towards that? I think the, the one thing we have to come back to when we talk about transitory workforce, when we talk about retention, when we talk about that it's hard to get anybody to, to stay sometimes, or we have to come back to the very point that you made earlier, Suzanne, that is we're all consumers. Um, most of us have somebody in our lives that we love, that we care about, and it's about making food safety personal. So I think um, we can train till the cows come home, we can have the best food safety written systems in place, but if we're missing the point of that food safety is ultimately about saving lives, it's about uh, all of us as consumers walking um, or trusting the food that we eat, then I think we're going to have a, a focus on food safety culture that's going to be to some extent artificial in the long run we have to be able to include the personal aspect. And I think that's also how, Suzanne, we get to uh, into, so I see there's a question around food trucks, mm. beautiful, innovative ways of serving food to the many. Um, the small companies, so we work with a small company in the UK, they've got four mm. employees. The way that you're engaging and you're continuously making sure that everybody cares about food safety is that you're uh, you're really relating to the fact that we're all consumers. So if you have an older parent, if you have a young child, if your wife is pregnant, if you have anybody in your family and the uh, group of, group of people that you love that are in the vulnerable groups, you help protect their lives. So I keep going back at back to that, Suzanne, when we're talking about these challenging situations and changes to the demographics and, and the, the way that we make food available to each other, that we have to find messages about making food safety personal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we'll come to the end of our questions fairly soon, but I, I've won exactly on that note that alone referred to. We've seen the explosion in food trucks. I suppose America, it began, it took over in Europe as well, Ireland, England during the pandemic. And here all the horse boxes, coffees and sandwiches and crepes and gorgeous food. A question here though is, um, 
How can you build a culture of food safety in mobile businesses like food trucks? Is that for me? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I suppose uh, it's a challenge. I'd yeah, say. It, is, it is a challenge. Yeah. Um, you're dealing with a small space, um, possibly a transient workforce. But a, a food truck is no different to, to any any business. We've got a, a huge um, percentage of, of small businesses in Ireland, um, and it, it still goes back to the same basics that have come up again and again today. The manager, the owner, has uh, uh, shows staff that food safety matters in everything that they do. A food safety management system, an awareness of the risks in that business that are particular to that food truck, proper training of staff, proper open communication channels when something goes wrong. So it's all those same things, regardless of if it's a truck or a big multinational. It's those same principles that are that are essential. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. So it's, it's just a smaller scale down version of the same challenges. Um, Lone, one of the last questions again, um, have you experienced much pushback from employees or indeed from management and companies you've worked with about creating a food safety culture? Um, it would be so easy to say no, um, but that, that's obviously not the case. Uh, yes, of course. I mean, this food safety is one of these items where it's really hard to get anybody to stand on a soapbox and says, I'm against it. But that's uh, it's not it's not hard to be the one that says I'm going to make sure we have a strong food safety culture continuously in our business. When the it really gets tough and when we start to get that pushback is when people have to start changing what they do every day. So when you have that maintenance manager and she has done this the, it's the same way for the last many years, and now that person has to start looking out for not leaving foreign material behind or contaminating a food product uh, contact surface in a different way and spilling that message to her team. Now it becomes where you're starting to, to bump into your organizational culture the way that it is every day. And that's where those consistent messages through a consistent rhythm, Brian shared some great, great examples of that. Musgrave has them as well, but where it's an ongoing message from the top that this is, this is what we accept. These are the practices that we accept. And then you combine that with that food safety is indeed personal for the maintenance manager as well and what she does every day. Thank you, Lone. Um, exactly. It goes back to the same principles. Ray, thank you for your input, obviously, from Musgraves and the, the challenges you have there with multiple businesses. Mike, thank you for your input from the US and your wonderful record and experience in food safety and also in agriculture and, and food regulation. I'd also like to thank Pamela from earlier, um, Gail and Brian here. And this really brings our FSAI Consultative Council for this year to a close. Thank you to everybody who took part, um, to your, all your valuable contributions, everybody who's watching, the questions you sent in, and the engagement that you had. And I hope you took forward something from it. On behalf of myself and the FSAI and the Food Safety Consultative Council, I'd like to thank all our viewers and we appreciate and look forward to seeing you all again soon at the end of this you might get an email you will get an email with a very short survey just a couple of questions if you could fill it in about the event and again thanks for joining us today